Hello and welcome to Backstage with Gig Performer. My name is Brett Pontecorvo and we are here every Thursday with some of the pros, with some of the semi-pros, with the people who are making use of Gig Performer to power their live performance. Um, if you are watching right now, go ahead and let us know in the comments where you're tuning in from. Um, we love to connect with people as they are um, coming in. Um, Today we have an awesome episode, um, but before we get into all of that, um, my question of the day is, what external hardware are you using with Gig Performer? Go ahead and let us know if you're using any external synths um, or anything like that. We've got Alex F. coming in saying cheers from Germany. Um, Alex, we are so happy to have you with us. Mark Spaven from the UK. Mark, so happy to have you here. Thanks for being on today. Um, and go ahead and let us know, uh, yeah, if you're using any external gear alongside of Gig Performer. Um, we have talked about this in several different episodes, but one of the things that is awesome about Gig Performer is how well it plays with other pieces of software and integrates. It really becomes the like primary brain of your performance. It's capable of driving um, everything, which is really nice. Uh, Manchester, England, JDev Ministry, Miss JDev Mystery. Thanks for being here, JDev. Um, happy to have you. Okay, so today we have a special guest, Carl Trier, who has actually been with us um, one previous time. So we'll make sure to uh, link to that below. Um, but today he's going to actually show us some different ways um, to deal with syncing external gear. Um, he's got a pretty detailed way that he wants to go through it. So if you're using external gear and you're trying to communicate time information um, with Gig Performer, this is going to be a really helpful episode for you. Um, next week, um, we were supposed to have uh, Dave Bolden coming on with uh, the Advanced Song Chooser. However, we've had to push this back one week. <laughs> so in two weeks, in two Thursdays, we're having uh, Dave come on to talk about the Advanced Song Chooser extension for Gig Performer. Um, and he touched on this briefly uh, in a past episode, but what's really fantastic about this um, is you have the ability to filter your songs very quickly while you're on stage. So if you are um, performing without a set list, this can be a real game changer for you. So you definitely will want to check out um, that episode. We've got Mark Michelli coming on using a Boss SY1000 as part of an aggregate audio interface. Awesome, Mark. Thanks for uh, sharing. All right, friends. Um, without further ado, I want to bring on our special guest for today. So welcome to Backstage, um, Carl. Thanks for being with us, Carl. Hey, good to be back, Brett. Yeah, so good to have you. Um, before we jump in, can you update us? How is to talk to us about your studio? What do you do? What's available for folks if they decide they want to come work with you? What what's uh, what's going on there? Sure, oh, absolutely. So in, in the previous episode, I think we focused a lot on uh, kind of the setup in my studio and the the hundred and two or hundred and four channels of audio that I built here. That time I had. Uh, way too many synths so in the intervening period i've kind of thinned out my synth collection a little bit to make the studio more productive for me personally mm. i was feeling a little bit of um option paralysis um, yeah. but uh, yeah the commercial studio principally designed for people who are interested in recording electronic music mm -hmm. um, so there's uh, 16 17 uh, synthesizers here that people can come in and use to to record and you know we've got um you know, a lot of great equipment for helping people record here, microphones and door controllers and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you can go to my website, jeremyunomusic.com mm -hmm. and uh, you can learn more about the equipment here and what we do here. And um, the, there's also a contact form. You can certainly reach out to me that way if you're interested in using the facility. Recently, we've been doing non-electronic music projects. I've been doing a lot of um, voiceover and um, um, uh, audio dubbing over video, but um, yeah, it's it's certainly set up to work on electronic music projects or, or mixing if you're interested in our mixing services also. Awesome. Awesome, man. Okay. So as we can tell, just by looking at your background here um, and a little bit about what you do, you have a lot of hardware synthesizers and you use yeah. Gig Performer 
which you talk extensively about how you're getting all of the audio into Gig Performer and why that's powerful. So um, if you want to know more about that, do check out uh, Carl's past episode. But today we're talking about time and syncing yep. time. So what? why would you want to do this? Why wouldn't you want to do this? How is this typically done? Give us the overview of what this, this even is so we have an idea before we jump into to details here. Right. So, so when you think about integrating external hardware into Gig Performer, there are really two sets of data that you're interested in. Um, one is MIDI note data, uh, and that's that's really very easy. That's the easy part to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, the other part is clock synchronization. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's a separate stream of data over the MIDI channel. Um, basically ensuring that the external gear is running at the same tempo as Gig Performer is running at. And if you're using any clock synchronized capabilities on synthesizers, that they're running at the same tempo and clock rate. So, you know, beat one, beat two, beat three, beat four, and a four, four time is happening at the same time that Gig Performer thinks it's happening. And why that might be important is if you're using, let's say, uh, an arpeggiator on an external synth, you want that arpeggiator to run at the same tempo and you want the notes it's arpeggiating to hit on the same beats. Mm -hmm. um, external drum machine, for instance, you obviously want it to run at the same tempo and you want it to start on the same beat one that Gig Performer thinks beat one is happening on. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a little bit of a challenge and that's what we'll work through today, mm -hmm. which is Big Performer natively does not output a MIDI clock. Mm -hmm. um, so you other ways into get that MIDI clock out of Gig Performer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, mm -hmm. it can be, there are scenarios where you might not even want to deal with this. If you're mm -hmm. playing all of the third, if you're playing all the parts manually on those external synthesizers, you may not need MIDI synchronization. You know, you're the, you're the synchronization, you're, right. you're playing a lot. Yes. Really where it can play is if you've got features on the synth that are tempo based that mm -hmm. need to be synchronized, like an arpeggiator, um, like maybe a clock sync LFO, something like that, then that's where you need to go going to need to be able to get either a clock out of gig performer into that synthesizer. Or we'll also demonstrate the reverse, which is feeding a clock from an external device into gig performer, um, which also has has other implications yeah okay cool so <clears throat> just to make sure i'm on the same page with you the primary reason you would want to, to do this is if you are doing either something that's arpeggiated or some sort of delays that you need to stay in time with the rest so if i was playing you know several digital se several vst instruments but i had a drum machine running and i wanted everything in sync that that might be a, a time um okay so well done for instance, that um, when you're talking about MIDI clock, you're really talking about both the synchronization, so the BPM yep. and beat one, beat three, or whatever time signature you're using. And we're also talking start-stop events. So when I hit play inside of Gig Performer, that might start a MIDI file player or an audio file player, mm -hmm. perhaps launch sequences that are running on VSTs inside Gig Performer at the same time you want external hardware. If you're using the external drum machine, which is what I'm going to demonstrate today, you want that to start at the same time on the same beat, perfectly synchronized. And, and one of the devices we'll show today even has the ability to shift the clock forward and backward a little bit to accommodate any delay in the actual MIDI signal. Modern synthesizers have very powerful inbuilt processes generally process MIDI data very quickly, and that's not an issue. Where it becomes a thing, you've got some legacy synthesizers, you, you're lucky enough, let's say, to own a, uh, an original Prophet 5. Yeah. The MIDI original Prophet 5, the CPU in there, wasn't running at gigahertz, it was running at one megahertz, I think. Mm. So it might be a little bit tardy in responding to clock messages, so you might actually need to almost shift the MIDI clock message slightly forward in time to accommodate the fact that it's going to respond to it slightly later than the beat. So one of the devices we'll show you has the ability to do that. Wow. Okay. So it sounds like you've got a, several different scenarios that work. Um, which What direction should we go in first, Carl? You want to go out of Gig Performer or into Gig Performer? 
Yeah, why don't we um, go into Gig Performer and first of all show why you might not even care about this. Okay, great. So let me pull up your screen here. Fantastic. All right, what are we what are we checking out here? What do we see? A very simple setup, so mm -hmm. we don't have to explain lots and lots of boxes here. Mm -hmm. You'll remember the original video I did with you across the top there is 104 audio inputs mm -hmm. from my audio interface, but we're just going to use four of them. Okay. We're going to take from my drum machine, the TR8S, which mm -hmm. away my favorite drum machine. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take a from my sequential Take 5, although it says Polybrute, it's actually a sequential Take 5 that's plugged okay. in there. Great. Through an audio the output, and I'm just going to run a simple MIDI file to run the Take 5, <coughs> so I don't have to get up and play it. It's, not the greatest MIDI file. I, I kind of threw that together this morning, but okay. So well, uh, for folks who are watching here, that that bottom orange block is um, a MIDI out block. Yep. So that's so, physical hardware. Yep. That's yep. going out through my MIDI interface. In fact, mm -hmm. in this case, going out through USB MIDI. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure your listeners are well aware that there are really two two physical mechanisms by which USB can get into a synthesizer. One is USB MIDI. So in this case, this is coming literally straight out of my PC through a USB cable to to my Take 5. Mm -hmm. um, is obviously DIN MIDI, the five pin standard. And if you want to, you actually need an external MIDI interface that converts USB into DIN 5 MIDI. Um, but in this case, I'm using USB. So, so yeah, the MIDI player is outputting MIDI that's going into that MIDI out block, which is then sending it over USB into my Take 5. Awesome. Okay, let's uh, show me what you got here. So when I hit play, you're going to notice one thing here, which is that you're going to hear the take five play, but you're not going to hear the drum machine play. And we'll okay. talk about why we need to solve that problem. Now, I'm going to um, do a couple of things on my end to make sure we don't get feedback. Okay. Hopefully. And, 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 and. So, um, um, hopefully you you heard that. I apologize for the feedback. I'm not sure why we that, that started happening now, but you would have heard the notes play. So I hit the play button in the top right. You yep. heard the tape start playing, but you didn't hear the drum machine start playing. Mm -hmm. Now, what we'll move on to is how do we solve that problem? There are two ways you could solve that problem. You could forget about the whole MIDI clock problem completely and just treat the drum machine um, as if it's a sound card or a, a sound module. That would be one way. Okay. Um, so in that case, what I could do is have another MIDI file player add in here. my TR8S and just mm -hmm. feed MIDI notes to that. So one note would be for the bass drum, a different note would be for the cymbal and so on. So we could just sequence the drum machine in exactly the same way we're sequencing the take five and that would work just fine. So okay. what would be the the benefit of doing doing it that way? Just saying, hey, like MIDI file straight out to the, the, the drum machine, like why would that be potentially advantageous for users? So the, the benefit of that is you're not going to have to worry about this whole MIDI clock transmission mm -hmm. okay. technique uh, to discuss, okay. um, which right now takes additional hardware. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There used to be plugins that you could use within Gig Performer that would create a MIDI clock that you could send out. One of them was called Clocker by uh, Expert Sleepers, but that's only a 32-bit VST now. Uh -huh. and. 32 VSTs are on their way out, and it's not a supported plugin. So mm -hmm. the benefit of doing this is basically you're, you're ignoring the entire MIDI clock issue. The, and what, the MIDI... what might you lose by going this route? So what you lose by doing this is you lose the ability to interact with the drum machine through its native controls to mm -hmm. add... In, in, essentially, you lose the ability to jam in real time on the drum machine. Right, okay. just acting as a sound module, I can certainly go over there and I can change things like bass drum tuning and I can change volume levels and things like that. But what I can't do is insert beats in real time, 
delete beats in real time, um, add new sounds. So I couldn't mm -hmm. bring in a, a crash cymbal on the 12th beat. Mm -hmm. So I can't edit the pattern in real time on the drum machine. It's gotcha. basically driven by the MIDI file that's triggering it. So you can just think of it as really like a VST where you can tune, tweak the sounds, but you know, you can't load a new preset or you can't add in notes on the fly. It's basically going to play whatever is in that MIDI file. Um, and that's it. Okay. So it actually <clears throat> is a totally viable option if you're working on something that's pre-composed and you love your sounds and you know yep. exactly what you're going to play. Um, and actually, when I'm listening to you talk, in that scenario, that is the best option, right? Because you're getting yeah. the benefit of the synth and you know you're not going in there to change stuff. When you're beginning to want to really like play it as, a, as its own thing, then we need this secondary solution, which is what? what? What would that look like for us? Yeah, so then what you need to do is you need to come <clears> up with something by which you can generate a MIDI clock from within Gig Performer that's okay. synchronized to Gig Performer. So it's synchronized to Gig Performer's tempo and it's synchronized to the start signal. So when you hit that play button in Gig Performer, the MIDI clock starts playing as well. So what I'm going to do here is open a different Gig Performer session. Okay. Um, and it sounds like... Um, so this is the one where you're using... You're sending... Um, an audio signal. You're yeah. sending it so out. This, yeah. Gotcha. So this is okay. yes. This is where we're where gig performer is in control of the start stop and gig performer is in control of the tempo. Even if that changes over time, so we can change the tempo mid song, but gig performer is in control over all of that. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Um, I said. Cool. Sorry. As I was, there are there are. Um, or there have been VST plugins that you could use within Gig Performer historically that would generate a MIDI clock, clocker being one. Um, what I'm going to demonstrate is actually using an external hardware device that integrates through a VST to generate a MIDI clock. And it's a device called the, used to be called the ERM multi-clock. It's now actually called a floating point multi-clock because the, the company got bored. But okay. so if you look, you just look up either ERM multi-clock or floating point multi-clock, you'll find information on it. There's also a competitive device that just came out. Some of your viewers may have heard of called the Mid-Renome. So like Midi-Renome. Uh, gotcha. Actually. It's a good name. It's a good name. Midi and Metronome mesh together. Works yes. It's exactly the same way. The two devices work the same way. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So what you this one is the, the Midi, MIDI click, MIDI clock? Multi-clock. Multi-clock. All right. Yep. So what's happening here? How does this work? So you'll see that this looks on the left-hand side exactly the same. Mm -hmm. We've got um, the same two audio signals. We've got the TR8S. We've got the Take 5. We've got the MIDI file player. We've got the MIDI out for the Take 5. But we've added this new plugin here called the multi-clock plugin. Okay. And th this multi-clock plugin is not out outputting MIDI. It's outputting audio. Mm. So I've got one of my audio outputs assigned to this device, and I'll show you the device in a moment. Okay. If we look at settings for this, they're very straightforward. Essentially, all you need to do is tell it what time signature you're running at. Okay. Um, so how many pulses. So if it's a 4-4 four, four time, it knows how many pulses it needs to send to match 4-4 four, four time. Gotcha. Uh, how many audio pulses. Now you have that in you, eight eight. Is that a an intentional choice? Um, it actually, for some reason, they didn't code it as four four. So they gotcha. basically all the time signatures. So they basically count eight eight as uh -huh. being four. Um, Understood. Have Understood. to talk to why they why they did it that way. Okay. Um, what you might wonder is, well, there are plugins that used to output MIDI. Mm -hmm. Why does the plugin not output MIDI? Yeah, and the theory behind this device is that MIDI transmission over DIN or USB from a PC is not exact. Uh, and, and I'm sure your viewers have seen this. I've seen this with doors where notes will be 
delayed a little bit or won't come out at exactly the right time. So because of the way the USB protocol works in a PC, you cannot actually guarantee that a MIDI message goes over a USB cable at precisely the right time to trigger the note right on the beat. But you can imagine if somebody built um, an application like Gig Performer that didn't send audio out at exactly the right time at exactly the right frequency, then it would be an application. So what the designer is doing here is relying on the fact that audio transmission from Gig Performer or any DAW is precise. It comes out at exactly the right time, at exactly the right frequency, perfectly synchronized. So this is using that capability to send out audio pulses, which the device I shows you then converts into MIDI. And because its sole job in life is to create perfectly timed MIDI signals, then you get a perfect MIDI clock. Um, the device that you showed me, I think maybe I didn't actually show viewers. Is that a hardware device? Yeah, we'll look at okay. that in one, okay. one second. Perfect. Just to, to um, um, hone in on one other concept about this. This is not a new concept. Mm -hmm. For those of you that remember back in the days of the tape machine, you know, the 24 track tape machine, mm -hmm. there used to be a mechanism by which tape machines could be synchronized to um, automation on mixing consoles and also MIDI devices. And that was an audio format that was recorded on the tape called SMPT, which was mm -hmm. an audio signal that could be read back and used to synchronize automation on desk. So this is a similar concept. Basically, we're sending an audio signal out that's perfectly synchronized to the track that drives an external piece of hardware that generates the MIDI signal. So I can you know, um, go to my camera, I can show you that device. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, so this would be a piece of hardware that you would purchase that would, and yep. I see, okay. So this is key. Yep. I didn't actually show folks this um, last time. Um, and this is yep. pretty sleek too. Okay, so we've got the audio coming in the back and then the two five pin in cables there. Yep, so you've got the audio audio coming in here, mm -hmm. and then you've got four channels of MIDI clock out. So um, basically you've got four different channels of MIDI clock mm -hmm. coming out. I'm only two for this demonstration. Mm -hmm. And it's basically using that audio signal, one, to indicate when it should start the MIDI. So as soon as the MIDI signal, as soon as the audio is coming in, it knows that that's a start. Mm -hmm. And then... It the interval between the pulses, the audio pulses, to drive the MIDI clock frequency. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about this device is you can actually modify the clock signal coming out a little bit. So you'll notice each of the channels has these two controls. Mm -hmm. I can shift the MIDI clock forward or backward a little bit. So I'm not changing the tempo, but actually changing the event timing. So if I've got a very old synth that's lagging by, let's say, 20 milliseconds, Mm -hmm. I can actually shift the MIDI clock forward in time by 20 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. So it comes back on beat. You'll, you'll go, well, that's time travel. How can you do that? And I'll explain how it yep. does that. In my... The other so, thing is, you can so that's that the shuffle. In... Um, we're like losing the center of your camera. If you oh. can, yep, there we go. There we go. Cool. Then you've got the shuffle. Yeah. Okay. Um, and what was shuffle? So that lets, lets you apply swing, right? So ah. you can apply swing to the channels independently if you wish. Gotcha. Very, very cool. Um, now, what would be the benefit of using something like this over just using uh, a software solution? Is it just significantly more accurate because it's audio? Yep. So, okay. one, this is this is audio precision accurate, mm -hmm. right? So, you think about audio coming out of any DAW or gig performer. Each sample, you know, is coming out. You know, the samples, you know, if you're recording at 48 kilohertz, the samples are coming out, you know, 48,000 times a second. Yep. Nicely. You know. mm -hmm. So, and when you, I mean, you imagine a DAW, which when you press play, track one started, you know, half a second after track two, that wouldn't be acceptable. Right. You know, so all of those audio streams are coming out precisely timed. Whereas if you try and do the same thing using um, MIDI over USB, it's close, but there are scenarios where, particularly if the PC gets overloaded or the Mac gets overloaded or there's a lot of traffic on the USB port, 
you can get variations in timing. So this is essentially sample accurate MIDI um, that's coming from this device. Perfect. So very powerful. Yes. Um, very okay. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So this is running into there. What's the next? What's the next step? Yep. So we'll we'll hit play here in a moment, but then the, the DIN MIDI is coming out. Also keep in mind that an audio solution would not have the ability to shift the MIDI streams, MIDI clocks independently. So we've got the ability to modify these four different MIDI clock signals to accommodate any variation in how quickly the synthesizer can respond to the MIDI clock. Um, and the fact that there's four audio, four outputs doesn't mean you're limited to four synths. You might have three or four synths that are very accurate in terms of their response to MIDI clock. So you could run all of those off one output. But if you've got a legacy synth, I've got a, a core digital delay that's 20 years old, mm -hmm. you know, respond horrendously to MIDI clock. Mm -hmm. You know, I can use that one output to drive that. But that MIDI output is then coming in to, in this case, my TR8S here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I'm also running beautiful. into my take five. Uh, you should just be able to see that back there. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. And they're both set up then to respond to external MIDI clock. So that's the other key piece is that, you know, you need to set up your hardware device to respond to an external MIDI clock rather than their internally generated MIDI clock. So depending on the device, somewhere in the global settings menu, typically you'll be able to tell it this is this is how you respond, uh, how you have it onto an external clock. So if you want to go back to the Geek Performer session, I'll show you yep. that. Uh, and again, we'll just run it for a few seconds because we've got this um, feedback issue. Sure. Um, if you just turn the volume off on your phone, right, that would fix yeah. the issue? Yeah, I've done that. That's not. Oh, it's not uh, working. Okay. Work. Uh, I think it's because it's coming back through the mic. So. Um, oh well, uh, can you mute it? Mute it on your phone too, or then we couldn't hear you. I, let's let's just try something real quick. Yeah. I think then you don't hear me, but uh, we were doing something because this worked before. Let's try this. Um, so I'm going to um, I'm going to unmute on my PC, but I'm going to make sure I'm not saying anything. So I'm going to unmute and hit play, All right, and then you it. should see the. One moment, I forgot. Uh, I need to change one setting on my take five that's for step three of my demo. So bear with me one moment. That was awesome. Yeah. Right. Try again. Okay. Mm. And if you can go to the camera. Yep. Mm -hmm. So what you'll see there is you've got the um, multi-clock has synced at 100 beats per minute. Yep. Which is... Whoa, awesome. Exactly what we've got there. And yeah. if I adjust the tempo here... Good type. Wow. 
then you'll see back on the multi clock. That's so fast too. Yeah. Um. Wow. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so if we can come back to maybe, uh, let me explain how it does the kind of time travel. Yeah. 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 So. That audio worked takes, beautifully, by the way. I'm sorry? That audio worked beautifully, by the way. Yeah. You did I'm not sure. I think it's the proximity of my phone to the speakers. That's the, gotcha. The, gotcha. What's feedback. But as I mentioned, one of its interesting capabilities is the ability to shift the MIDI clock, not tempo, but actual position in time forward or backward. Mm -hmm. So that if you've got a synth that's responding slowly to MIDI clock messages, you can actually send the MIDI clock message to it a little bit early. You're like, well, how is that possible? Because that would, you're, you're like backing up in time. Mm -hmm. Well, the way the device does that, and you can turn it off and on on the device, is it actually doesn't start sending MIDI clock at bar one, beat one. So when you set up your system, you have to know this a little bit. And Geek Performer actually has a count in capability, right? Mm -hmm. So the the you might have noticed that I was hitting play, but the MIDI file player was not actually starting immediately. It was starting a bar late. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, the multi-clock works in the same way. It waits for a certain number of pulses to come in before it actually starts sending MIDI clock out. So you can program it to either wait one bar or two bars. So it's already a bar in, has figured out the tempo, has figured out the exact timing of the MIDI clock messages it needs to generate. So when it gets to bar one, the start of, sorry, the start of bar two, it knows to start some of the MIDI clock messages a little bit earlier than all of the others. Huh. And that's Essentially, okay. how it shifts the clock forward and backward in time, and that's that's a very powerful capability that it has. Yes, and so using this setup now, you would have the full functionality of your drum machine. You could go in there and do anything you wanted, and really play it the way that it was intended to be played. Um, yeah, I, you want? I can just show that very quickly. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. So I think if we go back to camera, um, I will. Stop it. Um, so at the moment, it's only playing bass drum, but I can yep. bring in snare drum, right? Now, you could do that with the MIDI file player as well. That's just manipulating um, the mixer on the camera. But what I could also do in this scenario then is I could come here, and you might see I've only got one snare drum beat, mm -hmm. but I could... Uh, programming in additional beats uh-huh which you can't do if you're doing the midi file player that won't right. that won't um, because it's not actually when you're using the midi file player it's not actually starting the drum machine the drum machine is still in its stopped state all it's doing is treating the drum machine like it's a sound module and it's just sending midi notes to the drum machine the difference here with this scenario is when i started gig performer it sent both a clock message and a start signal to the drum machine. So the drum machine is playing what's programmed into it, the pattern that's programmed into it. And all the gig performer is doing is controlling the tempo and the start stop of the drum machine. So now I can use this just like any regular drum machine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and that, yeah, I'm like fascinated by this already because now it's like the whole world is available to you, right? Like if this is truly one of your like actual instruments that matters to you, that you're like, this is an instrument I play. Well, now yep. the whole world is available. Like you yep. can have the hardware and the software and everything working together, which is, is beautiful. Yeah. What I can demonstrate um, if we've got time real quickly yeah. is let me demonstrate how, how that would impact with the um, take five. Yeah. So let me, so what I'm what I'm basically going to do here is change the MIDI clock source on my take five. Um, it's currently sending clock out, mm -hmm. and I want it to respond to clock in, mm -hmm. and I want it to take that clock from the MIDI cable. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now, hopefully, I didn't practice this beforehand. So <laughs> <laughs> this is live, folks. It's all live. I love it. I love it. And what I'm going to do is actually take away the. Um, MIDI file player. So now, theoretically, when I hit play, the drum machine will start after one bar. 
and I should be able to go over to the take five and play an arpeggio with that arpeggio synced to the same clock. Fantastic. Wow. And you'll notice some other notes triggering there, which is because um, there's actually note data coming from somewhere as well. And we're going to have to figure out where the note data is coming from over the okay. MIDI channel. But you could hear that when I played notes on the arpeggio, they were synchronized. It was all, uh, yes. Yeah. So that's the, the downside of this approach, of course, is that you're having to buy a piece of extra hardware. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to go maybe back to the... the my face now. <laughs> yep, yep, and we're on the gig performer screen yep. too. So, so, yep. you know, but you know, to be clear, if this is a massive part of your workflow, then purchasing something dedicated is actually probably a good idea, right? Yeah. <laughs> like if you, if you're already running all of this stuff, then it, you know it's not uh, it's not crazy. We actually somebody's writ wrote in here, um, Chris Bartley. I use the baby multi clock on my pedal board to sync my pedals. If I want to run the pedal with no computer, I keep everything in sync. And yeah. then it's reassuring that Carl and I have had the same issues and found similar solutions. Gig Performer makes it easy. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, cool. there is all the multi-clock. Um, so there's a, a, a reduced number of output versions of the multi-clock that's a little bit cheaper. And I wouldn't say it's a horrendously, I think they're $500 for the larger version. But yeah, there is a smaller version, which which uh, you can also look at. But company is floating point now, not ERM. But you can find them on Reverb under ERM. But if you want a new one, you need to go to floating point. Or they sell them through Perfect Circuit and all the usual places. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Okay. So we're 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 clear on this you said there was another way yeah, yeah. and what yeah. what would that give you why would you choose another way what like what are what are the options yeah the, so the the third way when you've um is to actually feed clock into gig performer the way i just showed if gig performer is the center of your workflow the center of your life performance I think the way I just showed it is probably the optimal way. Gives mm -hmm. you the makes gig performer the center of control. But the yes. third way is actually to feed a clock into gig performer from an external device. So in way number one, we didn't have any clock. In way number two, gig performer was controlling the clock through the multi clock plugin and the multi clock device. But the third way is to actually um, have a clock signal from an external device feeding into gig performer. And I think if I think, you go um, to the- You maybe quit, you maybe I, quit the I window again, but I can still hear you, so. <laughs> um, Me, I am so sorry. No, 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 it's okay. It, it, it absolutely happens. Um, so if you're gig performer centric- So the third way is- Go, go ahead. Yeah, feed-, feed uh, from a, uh, an external source. So what I'll show you here, because we'll, we'll need to share my screen, is mm -hmm. show you how you set that up in Gig Performer. So currently, um, Gig Performer does not have a way to um, generate clock natively, mm -hmm. um, but it does have the ability to accept an external clock mm -hmm. um, from an external device. But then keep in mind that external device is controlling song start and song stop and the tempo mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay um now where that might be useful is if you're using um let's say a combination of an external um uh let's say using something like a, an akai mpc or a roland mc 707 something like that where it's generating some sounds of its own. It might be also sequencing some external equipment through its outputs, but you also want it to synchronize because you're running VSTs inside of Gig Performer. And it might be sequencing those VSTs inside of Gig Performer. So you might be using Gig Performer more as a, a kind of VST host and you're using you know, some kind of external groove box as kind of the center of 
life performance workflow. And if you do that, then this is um, a way to do that. So I think if you can um, go back to the screen sharing. Yep. Um, okay. Um, perfect. Yep. Um, and remove some pieces. Okay. So you, you actually have to tell Gig Performer where you want the clock to come from. Okay. And you can do that under um, Rig Manager. Okay. And under Rig Manager, um, and I'm not an expert on Rig Manager, but no. um, under Rig Manager, you can basically set up a. So, what Rig Manager lets you do basically is associate a logical name with a physical MIDI device mm -hmm. or physical MIDI. So I've set up this alias called TR8S. It's going to the physical device TR8S. And under here, what I can do is choose this option which says responds to MIDI clock. Mm, okay. Um, now that to me kind of implies that the TR8S is going to respond to MIDI clock, but it's actually Gig Performer is going to respond to the MIDI clock. So think of it gotcha. that way. Okay. So you've just done and that and now Gig Performer is listening. Yep. And you can verify that that um, actually is enabled if you come and look at the MIDI assignment list. Not MIDI assignment list, sorry, wrong window. That's okay. um, MIDI ports. So if you actually come and look at the MIDI port window, you scroll down, where is it? Let's try that again. I think I did something wrong there. Window, big manager. Um, seems seems like you've got a few MIDI ports there. Yes, quite a few. Yeah. <laughs> oh goodness! Sorry. Now it's checked. Is it uh, whatever I see. I, did I see. Okay. So you'll see the the checkbox there, and then you'll also see it. Um, and you'll also come and look at MIDI ports. Uh, then you will see it there. Ah, okay. Perfect. Perfect. Got it. Um, so you can't click here. This is uh, if you click here, it tells you no. Go turn this on in Rig Manager. Go to the Rig Manager, which that is advantageous if you think about it, because um, getting it set up that way would mean when you turn the Rig Manager on, all of your stuff does exactly what you want it to do at the exact moment, right? So, um, okay. So we've got that set up. Now what happens? Yeah, so now, um, theoretically, if I go press play on mm -hmm. the drum, Gig Performer will start, and you'll hear the MIDI file player okay. start. All right. Oh, I'm just, rather than use my camera, I'm just going to come over here and you trust me that I'm pressing play on the drum okay. machine. Fantastic. And it didn't work. Let's try again. There we go. There we go. So you can hear the drum machine running. You can hear the MIDI file player running. I hit stop on the drum machine. They both stop. If I adjust the tempo. And basically, the control is now coming from the drum machine. The drum machine. Wow. Okay. And yep. so that's responding to in the 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 BPM section on the uh, on Gig Performer. Um, yes. Wowie. Okay. So the, the use case for that, really, I would think of as if you're using an external groove box like a an Akai or an MPC or something like that to kind of. Sequence external gear and maybe sequence VSTs inside of Gig Performer, and and really kind of your your show is being run from that device, and Gig Performer is the auxiliary, uh, just another instrument if you like collection mm -hmm. of instruments. Whereas the one we showed with the multi clock is Gig Performer is the the show runner, it's the master, and everything else is an auxiliary to that. Yes. Um... The upside, too, of running something that way is if you're just getting started and experimenting, um, it, cheaper. it's cheaper. But 
yeah, but if you're not, it, yeah, it, it's sort of like with everything, I think when we, you know, talk through these different solutions, really what we're hitting up against is what are we trying to do and what is the mm-hmm. most expedient and effective way to do the thing? Um, yeah. so, so context is key. Um, yeah, so, it, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, what do you find yourself doing most often and why? So, you know, in the previous video, we talked about Gig Performer principally being my, my jam, jamming tool, right? Yes. That's that's what I am in. And rather than have to deal with the overhead and complexity of a door, if I'm just experimenting with sounds and trying to develop a song, then I'll come into Gig Performer. And in that scenario, I tend to use the multi-clock because a lot of the sounds that I want to develop or ways I develop music are around... Um, arpeggiators in some of the applications and definitely tempo synced LFOs. So, you know, the, making sure that modulation of an oscillator or, you know, filter or something like that is in perfect sync with the tempo. So I'll, I'll typically use that um, approach. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if it's just, you know, I think approach number one, if you don't care about synchronized LFOs or arpeggiators, but you're really using um, you're playing instruments by hand completely natively, mm-hmm. then I think approach number one works. Um, I think if you need that tight synchronization with the BPM of Gig Performer because you are using clock synchronized capabilities on synths and you want to interact with those things like I was, you know, kind of modifying the drum machine on the fly, mm-hmm. then I think option works best. I think option number three, if, if you're the kind of person that really is dedicated to running their live shows from a groove box or an external device, I think option number three works best. You know, the, there is a cost associated with option number two, but, you know, if you go with the mini device, it's not significant. You can distribute the clock message. You know, use, you can use uh, MIDI through boxes and send the clock message to 10, 12, you know, as many synths as you want because it's not channel-based. MIDI mm-hmm. clock does not use MIDI channel per se. It's independent of that. So you can distribute the clock message to all the synths. The only downside you'll find is if you want to route the clock into the synth and MIDI notes into the synth at the same time, you'll need to merge those two data streams somehow. Mm-hmm. So maybe not the topic today, but the multi-clock <laughs> has the ability to merge MIDI data together. Okay. So you can actually... MIDI note data in through a USB port and have that merged with the clock data. And the interesting thing is that the multi-clock makes sure the clock data takes priority over the MIDI note data. So it will let the MIDI note data be off by a few hundred milliseconds, but it won't let the clock be off. The clock will take priority. Mm. Or you can use an external device um, like a MIDI interface, like the Mio XL, Mm -hmm. which is a a USB and MIDI interface that has the ability to merge two data streams together, so merge the clock and the MIDI dog data together. But I, I typically don't sequence my synths from Gig Performer. I typically play them by hand using the arpeggiators or the built-in sequences, so the clock's more important to me. Yes. Okay. So I'm, we're coming close to the end. So a couple things here. First off, if you're watching and you have questions for Carl, put them in the, the comments right now so we can start getting those answered. My personal question is, for folks who are watching who are wanting to integrate hardware, perhaps they haven't um, they haven't taken the leap yet to be like, I'm going to get this synth or that synth. Um, what would your recommendation be for picking a fantastic piece of hardware that would play well with Gig Performer that would be enjoyable to use? My recommendation? Yeah. <laughs> Gosh, that... That's I know a it's really probably hard. a hard one to answer off the top of your head, but yeah, if somebody's watching and they're like, well, I actually really do want some sort of an external synth or drum machine, not something that they typically do. What direction would you yeah. point them in to get started? Yeah. I mean, I actually think there's some really amazing inexpensive synths now. Um, the uh, Arturia Mini Freak is very, very popular. Okay. Um, it can sound like an analog synth. It can sound like a digital synth. It's very small and compact. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you know, it's, it's a, a very good price point. There's also a VST version of it, so you can build sounds and play sounds on the external hardware version, but you can also then translate those patches into the VST version if you don't want to take that synth on the road. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a very popular device. You know, in terms of um, drum machine, I mean, I, I will say that, you know, if you think about the Roland 808 as being a classic, I think the Roland TR is, in my opinion, an equivalent classic. So it's like the 21st uh, your, century. Your audio era. popped off when you said the name of that synth. So you said the equivalent classic is what? The the TR8S. I think the Roland TR8S that we're showing today is the 21st century equivalent of okay. the of what the weight was to the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. The TR8S is the same equivalent to the to the uh, current decade and the decade before. So those are two pieces of hardware I highly uh, recommend in terms of sonic capability. If you're kind of an analog purist, mm -hmm. because the Mini Freak is a digital synth, if you're an analog purist. Um, I don't think you can go wrong with a Moog, but they're expensive. Um, there's there's, there's only, honestly lots of good products in the Behringer line um, that are very inexpensive for pure analog uh, synthesis. So, yeah, um, so those are some great it's, options it's for folks. Definitely a decade where there's no shortage of hardware synths, despite there being thousands of VSTs now, many of which can do things no hard will ever be able to do. I like the tactile capability of a mm -hmm. physical synth. That's mm -hmm. kind of why that's that's what I grew up with. There's also something to be gained, I think, from the limitations of a hardware synth. Um, and if for folks who are trying to dabble in this and they're not ready to pull the trigger on hardware, if you get a, a VST model of something that is hardware many of those synths still have the same limitations. And when you're forced to work in the workflow of, um, you know, like the Prophet is a great example of that. Like there's some like things about that synth that don't exist in serum <laughs> or pigments. And when you're forced to work with it, you start to kind of connect the dots on like, oh, that's why the signature sound is what it is or right. why folks do particular things. So I think there's a lot to be learned from diving into um, the limitations, you know, and then, then when you get into a program like serum or you get into, uh, you know, anyway, serum pigments, but I guess there's a whole list of stuff that people like, then all of a sudden your approach to sound design is totally different because you've figured out some more expedient ways to handle, um, to handle things. Um, anyway, that's my personal, personal opinion, but, um, you know, and obviously the tactile stuff is really hard to, uh, to beat, but, just what it does to the way you think is so paramount. Um, have you have you found that, Carl, when you like open up a, a VST synth that you still are translating through analog? Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I mean, I'm a fan of pigments, but I still tend to think of you know LFOs and ADSRs and basic waveforms and things like that. And, mm -hmm. You and, said you, you are know, a fan of pigments. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it if you're used to analog gear, you definitely still think of waveforms and ADSR envelopes and, and sometimes you have to force yourself to explore the thousands of modulation routing options that are in a tool like pigments mm -hmm. and the different types of oscillator and sound generation. Um, but I do think something like Mini Freak, which has a VST equivalent and is digital based, gives you a little bit of the best of both worlds. The physical device is restricted to what its interface can provide, knobs mm -hmm. and sliders, and um, you can migrate that to the VST, mm -hmm. and maybe the VST lays things out in a way in which you might explore additional options that are not apparent through the physical interface on the device. But but uh, I know that that's, you know, if you look at anybody saying, what's the first synth I should buy? Man, that one comes up all the time now. Okay, awesome. Chris wants to know, do you have issues with keeping gear in sync when connecting through MIDI through? Uh, MIDI through into and out of a synth sometimes, particularly if it's a legacy synth, but mm -hmm. using it through a breakout box, you know, a uh, uh, MIDI splitter, no. Okay. Okay. All right. I have it set up here. I have, in some cases, I'll set the clock up going to um, eight different synths from one output on the multi-clock. Wow. 
Okay. So if you're running it through an old synth, beware. But if you're running it through a splitter, split away. Uh, what about yep. running through a new synth? Generally not a problem. Okay. Yep. Okay. Generally not a problem. Cool. Um, all right, man. I thought I had one more question for you, but I'm wondering if I've lost it. Um, maybe I have. have I didn't we... know that they thought the downstream gear seems delayed and it's actually starting a bar after. So I've got ah. performer set up a bar after I hit the play button. Um, gotcha. Which is why it sounds, sounds like that. Gotcha. Um, somebody wants to know if you use the stream deck. Uh, I don't. I had okay. one. I didn't find it useful, personally. Um, I use the stream deck for literally everything. Um, not that they asked me, but I also use it in conjunction with Keyboard Maestro. And those two things together are such a powerful combination. Um, and also, this whole stream is run through Stream Deck. So um, it's really powerful. And Gig Performer does have a built-in um, extension where you can control all sorts of stuff. So if you're on the fence about Stream Deck, I would highly endorse Stream Deck. Um, but it does depend on your workflow. Um, for me, it's not just a device for one thing. So it made, it made a ton of sense. Um, all right, folks. Well, Jeremy, this was all, uh, Jeremy, Carl, I switch you back and forth. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, thank you for being with us. This was super, super, uh, informative to me. My mind is like really open from all of this. Um, so thank you for sharing. Um, and again, folks who would like to contact you for recording or for experimenting with your synthesizers can do so below. We have a link to your website. They can send you a message and um, highly recommend working with Carl. Um, all right. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, we will see you all in two weeks. Um, we have Dave Bolden coming on to do advanced song chooser. Um, thank you all for being with us and we'll see you soon. And thanks again, Carl. Yeah, thanks.